Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site at AAA, the American Anthropological Association. We are now sitting down with Dr. Maria Vizirenu. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you for coming out to the show. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm super happy to have you. This is gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna talk about a lot of very interesting things. And something, let me give a quick background. Quick background on Maria is, uh, she's a research associate and lecturer at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. She's a researcher at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. She's a global health PhD at Arizona State University, where she was uh, understanding how people build mental models of complex health phenomena. And she created the Eating Perception Lab, and now also an evangelist of Science Communication Journal Club, providing scientific community with evidence based tips on how to engage the public. And as you know, we care a lot about science communication on the show, so we're really excited <laughs> to unpack this. First of all, first of all, how the heck did you get involved in anthropology? It's a really strange story. I'm from Ukraine. I studied business in my bachelor's because that was the way to get out of the country and live somewhere else. Then I got into health personally, and I thought at some point there was a lady, I was managing a health food store, something like a local uh, Whole Foods. A lady came in, asked me for advice. I gave her advice. She said, yeah, but what's your degree? And I said, none. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go back to school. Did my uh, MS in health promotion, which is like public health. I kind of liked it, but I was mostly interested in how people get to understand what it means to you well and that's a little bit more anthropology than public health interventions so i ended up in arizona with a global health degree it was completely new there was only one person graduating and there was so much freedom to do whatever you wanted to do it's very interdisciplinary so it's not just anthropology it's not just public health my uh, research was really a bunch of psychology, nutrition, and medical anthropology combined into mm. a, a weird thing nobody else was doing, so I did that. And so I was studying how people, the way you said it is correct, but I make it sound very complicated. Mm -hmm. If I had to simplify it, it's gonna be, I study why people believe certain things are healthy to eat and why they think there's a certain way to eat foods. So, yeah. So that's that. Be be <laughs> because, the way that we see the world and the w with the if we only have one perception on something on a complex issue that's going to immediately impact the way that we see things versus if we have 10 or 20 or however many perspectives we're trying to synthesize into one that could lead us to having a greater knowledge about what we're eating or how yeah. we're behaving with our health um did you know that you when were wait how old were you were you born in ukraine yeah i spent most yeah. of my life there and then did you, so like 18 you moved to the US? I was actually 15 when 15. I won uh, this giant competition that was paid by the US government Whoa. to send kids from those areas who know English well, who has some potential. It was called Future Leaders Exchange Program. It was called FLAX. So I was an exchange student in high school. I met an American host family that it was in, in Indiana. Uh, I was there for a year, went back home, started my business degree, then eventually came back to Indiana and finished it there. So that's nice. when I stayed alone. My whole family is home. Uh, Still? Except my brother is now in uh, Los Angeles with me, but it's very cool. recent. Yes. Other than that, everyone's there. So I was weirdly alone here for about 12 years. Yeah. Just Whoa. kind of making my way through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, how did, how did you know that you wanted to come to the United States? Uh, I, I loved English. I loved studying different cultures. I was really into sci-fi video games, and a lot of <laughs> them are set in America. Which one? So, oh, all the terrible horror stuff, Resident Evil, Silent oh, Hill. Oh, you are? Oh, cool, yeah, those that's are my other, thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, actually, the reason I know the language so much better than all my peers at that time is because I started playing video games. Mm -hmm. All of them were not quite, uh, you know, you know, sold certain ways, not translated. So you had to learn the English, English. get a dictionary out, and actually understand yeah, what's yeah, happening. Interesting. That's yeah, I love video Most games. Most people wouldn't know, think about <laughs> video games being able to teach a language. That it's that's like cool. cartoons in some other countries. Me, it was yes. video games. Yes, yes. Story heavy, so I had to learn the words. You know, yeah. now I envision you um, slaying zombies in Resident Evil. You know, yes, I'm really excited yeah, for the remake that's coming out <laughs> soon. So yeah, are yeah, they on like six? Is that what it is? Oh no, they're six, making the second seven. one, which is the oh, original. They're making the second one. Do they stop yeah. at five or what? what it was it six. I, I stopped six, paying but attention, but yeah, okay. um, yeah, I'm not very good at uh, shooting. I just want the story. 
the stories oh, <laughs> stories are very interesting video game stories so yeah. okay so this is cool so you come out to you know to indiana now what is it like i just want to know about this cause this is an interesting point along the story is mm -hmm. what is it like when you um are dealing with like an american host family what you know it? uh i was you know, I have to tell you, whoever psychologists picked me were right because you have to be very flexible. That's why the program is called Flex. Uh, I think I dealt with it so well that they wanted to see me back in a couple of years and let me stay there for free while I was finishing my college. It was a really amazing family in Indiana. It's There's always differences, right? Let's the give big, them a shout out. Um, oh, it's Deanna Hershey. Uh, she's not with us anymore, but her daughter, Deb Hershey, I saw her at my wedding a couple of years ago. She lives still in Indiana. I love her. So yeah, shout Aww. out to them. Yes. Uh, they made it possible for me to be here awesome. because otherwise, what would I do? You know, it's expensive to be in this country, especially alone. So yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that. that's huge. Wow. And so, yeah, yeah the, fl the flexibility, because I've also, um, we just we just had a show where we were um, talking to someone that's homeless about, about street life. And, uh -huh. and when we were talking to them, they had went through 48 foster care centers. And um, again, it was because of a lot of inflexibility when you get to a foster family that mm -hmm. you keep just butt heads. And so when you are f more flexible um, with things, um, and there's a lot of other variables that go into it, but yeah, um, it's it's just being open culturally, which is probably why I ended up in anthropology all along. Because mm -hmm. when I first came to the United States, and the funny thing is that some of the things I noticed at first ended up being really big theories in my dissertation work. I never realized that until recently. When I first came to the United States and I was in high school and somebody gave a bunch of pencils to everyone to uh, for everyone to get a pencil, right? Americans would uh, take a pencil and pass it along, somebody takes a bed. And I was like, whoa, uh, something's weird here. If you were in Ukraine and that happens and I'm the first person in line, I'm gonna start handing out every single pencil out. And if I'm done and I don't have one myself, I'm like, oh, I guess I have to go get one for myself. There, there's a very known dimension in psychology of collectivism versus individualism. Yes. Uh, so finally, you know, Eastern Europe is considered more collectivist than Americans who are more individualistic. Yes. And that for me was the perfect first example. I had no idea yet, I was 15. But funnily, in my dissertation work, um, that's one of the theories I had for why people think about food differently. Okay, we have yeah. to talk <laughs> about that. That's so cool. That's, uh, that's, I think that's, the f that's a very, very relatable story, the pencil story. <laughs> It's yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a huge difference. The first person that gets the bundle either passes the bundle along, or they go and give everybody else. Take care else. of the group first, you know. Even if you suffer, at yeah, the end, you have no pencil. Yeah, there yeah. And and then this is also another example of this. Actually, is when you walk into a restaurant with a group of people, and you're, uh, it's one of those self-serve places, maybe like Chipotle or whatever. Uh -huh. And you're uh, the the group orders food and sits down. You're you're the one that gets four water glasses, four knives, four forks, ten <laughs> napkins, and you bring it all to the table. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah there's the, uh, that's so cool. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah. and that's good that you. And if, now now tell us about the transition from Indiana to Arizona. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was actually very tough because here I was coming. I'm always the new kid, it sucks. First I'm in a business and marketing, then I come to public health arena and I don't know, okay, I'm starting to catch up, it's been two years. Then I come to Arizona State and realize, oh, this is a little bit less health, way more anthropology, what's anthropology? And I get thrown into a completely different field that I ended up absolutely loving because they, they're able to answer any question you can think about, about humans yeah, and related yeah. to us. They can be like, cool, let's figure out how we're gonna test that and what theories we're gonna apply and the methodology and boom, we can answer whatever you have asked. It's amazing, right? It's fun. So when I ended up there, the hardest part about a PhD probably is to figure out what you're gonna do. Sometimes you have an idea, sometimes your professor might join you on their you know, project, I come in with all these crazy ideas and all this nutrition stuff that nobody was necessarily doing. So I had I had a really great mentor, D Dr. Daniel Hrushka. He's a superstar, and he's here at some point during the conference. And he helped me pick my topic, and it was a weird one. It was my first time here. I knew I was coming to the conference, and there was a call for papers about blame. Um, so how people blame different foods on uh, chronic diseases across cultures. That's why I went back to Ukraine and I was like, let's see how Eastern Europeans feel about things. And I found an interesting cool thing. Is that okay if I say it now? Yes. So I was looking at health perceptions, uh, perceptions of healthy eating. Mm -hmm. And I started noticing, I couldn't quite test it yet, that Eastern Europeans generally, 
everyone generally, when you ask them what's healthy eating, they start talking about foods, what makes them bad, good, healthy, and healthy. Then they might mention some other things, like maybe you shouldn't overeat late mm -hmm. in the day, mm -hmm. maybe you should always have breakfast, maybe mm -hmm. you shouldn't skip meals. Those kind of other things have to do the way you consume mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. regardless of what it is. And I noticed that Eastern Europeans cared, seem to care more about those the ways that you eat food. I call them eating styles. In eating my styles. That's what I just said to call it, yeah. Yes, I, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I thought, I wonder if that's true. So I started paying attention. And uh, the literature on collectivism, they will, you know, once you go into it, it's in psychology, there are known cognitive differences between collectivist and individualistic societies. Collectivistic societies tend to have a more what they call a holistic pattern of attention, where as they think of something, they'll remember more about the context than the f focal feature. And individualistic societies tend to have a more analytical type uh, of attention where they'll remember more about like a certain thing. They do, you know how there's a picture of an aquarium with some fish and some background, some whatever it is, uh, greenery. A, collect a, re a collectivistic person who like, scores really high on a collectivist scale you let them look at it, take it away, say, what do you remember? They'll remember a lot more detail about what, what everything else looked like than the f central fish. So anyway, so that's kind of cool, right? And I thought, could that be applied to food perceptions? Because I'm looking first at the foods people think are good and bad to eat. And then I'm looking about all this like kind of context of when do you eat it, yes, um, at yes. what times, at what intervals, so not focusing on the food. I thought, wouldn't that be crazy if partly why Eastern Europeans care more about all this context stuff, e eating styles, is their cognition style. Yeah. And I actually tested it in two studies, and yeah, it was partly responsible. So it wasn't about the fact that all these people live in Ukraine and Romania, Eastern yeah. Europe, and uh, for some reasons they care more about eating styles. It was actually explained by their level of collectivism. So their cognition yeah. made them think a little bit differently about healthy eating and focus more about um, all these different aspects of the way you consume different foods. And that's really cool because there's always been a lot of um, focus on nutrition, nutrients, the foods that you eat, obviously. But now there's so much literature, amazing literature coming out. About like intermittent fasting and stuff like that. On the importance of the timing of when you eat, how many times a day, what's the time range it really matters and it seems to be related and um, to all sorts of chronic conditions, yeah. metabolic syndrome, so yeah. the way we consume food really matters too. So it's I was like really excited about that. It's just mm -hmm. like a constant stream of glucose for the cells versus a, a period of time without any glucose, having to burn fat, and then sure you eat and then yeah. you get some food. Yeah. It has a lot to do with our internal clocks, circadian rhythms. Actually, I mentioned to you earlier that I do like this little uh, whiteboard videos where I yeah. draw out yeah, concepts. And I, yeah, that was really good. Yeah, and my favorite one is the one I did on my dissertation topic, and it was about the time of eating and explaining why that would matter. And there's great literature on this now showing that there's certain clocks in your body, the way your organs and everything works, uh, works off light patterns. Like, is it light? Is it at night? What time of the day it is? But it can also be kind of messed up if you eat at funny times, like if you eat late at night, it sort of deregulates certain things and eventually it might be a risk factor for certain diseases. So that's kind of crazy and I think that's cool because a lot of us lead, eat like late at night, right? Totally. So. Yeah. Anyway, that's um, something to look into. I'm, I'm such a culprit. I know, now you're trying to think of all the things you're doing wrong. Um, you know? you, well, I love how you made a distinction between what we eat and the eating styles. <clears throat> because I don't think there is enough of a, of a conversation about eating styles. Mm -hmm. I think w we've had a couple on the show where we just talk about how interesting it is that we've never eaten three times a day with so many options, with 100% full stomach every time we eat. And so this is a new phenomenon in civilization. Yeah. And so when you look back Throughout evolution, it was it wasn't a it wasn't an 8 a.m. noon and 6 mm -hmm. p.m. full meal every time type of thing. So, and there was definitely not um, <laughs> the refined sugar water uh, that we that we that we drink yeah. now, um, sodas and all that other kind of stuff. So, the high fructose corn syrup. So, so. There, so I like I like how the you know eating perception comes with styles. That's that was so cool. 
Tell, yeah. Teach us more about this because the idea of collectivist thinking driving more, I guess, uh, uh, de determining a little bit more nuance around mm -hmm. eating versus individualistic thinking, that was a pretty interesting one. I thought it was crazy at first. I thought, no way, that, that's too cool, you know? But yep, it was there, so it predicts. Um, you're more likely to pay attention to all this context stuff about eating. But it's not obviously the only thing, you know, for example, back home, uh, you know, I was born in USSR. It was all USSR back yeah. then. And even then, some of these um, eating styles are actually more like uh, ancient wisdoms from coming from generation past that care about stuff like that. Like, hey, yeah. you don't eat late in the day or at a certain hour or you shouldn't be snacking between when you eat. A lot of this stuff, once I start looking, there's very little research on it, but some of it is from Eastern Europe, some of it is coming from Asia. There's a lot of very interesting ideas about uh, timing of food from there. So it's not really new, but you know why it's not really on our radar? Because it's so hard to study people's diets. Sometimes it's a lot easier to figure out what they ate than all the other factors, like when and what were they doing, were they distracted? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's all this literature on yes. if you're watching TV or talking to friends, you tend to be, eat a bit more without being more full, you know? So yeah. there's all these things that you might, we might not be paying attention to and they matter as well. Um, just a little plug, I've never met this person, but there's a panda lab because the professor is called Dr. Panda in California and he's studying uh, all of these contextual factors about eating. There is a free app you do and you like have to say what you're doing while you're eating and oh, what time it is. Yes. And he's sort of looking at um, yes. you know, like a map of when mm -hmm. every intake happens. So I'm really excited to see like what that come up, comes out to. Yeah. His uh, outcomes I think are like weight management, showing that uh, you lose weight much easier if you eat within a certain window. So like a lot of this more like fads about eating that have some really good truth to them. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's eating from noon until eight is that's already uh, not eating for sixteen hours a day. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and you can easily do two meals at, at each time um, mm -hmm. at, at the end caps. Um, whoa! And then that's cool. That th it's tough to do quantified self on your own eating habits because yeah. it's a lot of information to log, and we're already very. It's. Mm -hmm. Busy in many ways. Yeah. I mean, some of these are, and you know, I, one of my favorite topics is evolution of human food preferences. Even though oh, I wasn't, cool. I'm not an evolutionary, uh, you know, person, but while I was at Arizona State, there is a, um, it's called uh, Evolutionary Medicine Center, mm -hmm. and it's Center for Evolutionary Medicine mm -hmm. that looks at how we can look at our health and disease from more evolutionary perspective to really get at the ultimate causes of why we are the way we are. Anyway, I took a course with Dr. Nessie, who is running the center. I really learned a lot, and then I ended up writing a couple of articles for Encyclopedia of, of um, Evolutionary Psychology on how people perceive food, how they make their choices. So I love that stuff. And yes, the environment we live in these days is extremely different. And it's the most natural thing that we're all overweight, you know? Why wouldn't we be? We're sitting around doing nothing. There's a lot of great talks uh, this weekend about that as well. Evolutionary anthropologists, yeah. they're looking into that as well, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. This, this, yes, we've heard s sitting is the new cancer. We've, mm. um, we've heard so many Depends things how like you that. sit. If you Depends sit like a hunter-gatherer, yeah. which I went to that talk. Which, which is like, It's which more is like, what, like, you know, on the like floor, this. you're not leaning on anything. You're sitting okay. on the floor, so you're kind of engaging more muscle. Yeah, and that's like cross-legged? Sort of, or you're like sitting really low. I can't show it right now. I'm wearing a dress. Yes, yes. But, um, you know, sitting on a chair is yeah. too relaxing. You're it's not engaging anything. Relaxing. It's not great. Yeah. You know, so if you sit in a different way, let's imagine there's nothing to sit on. Yeah. You're on the ground. You actually would be engaging more muscle. You'd be better off. It was so cool. Because, and you're yeah. also moving around more because you get sore. You might yeah. lean on an elbow. You might le lean a leg out. Those yeah. micro movements apparently micro like movements really matter. Micro movements are huge. You know? we, had a, we had a conversation um, with Pablo from, um, from Stanford who was working on like furniture that does things like makes you like move from side to side while you're working. Yeah. And like other interesting things like the chair will actually run away from you and hide because it'll be on its own like that's pretty um, cool and then it'll make you go and like get the chair and stuff and yeah it's just I kind of like it, it i don't know yeah yeah i might buy it yeah yeah i know okay. <laughs> i know it's interesting stuff like that um that's amazing and there's evidence I'm for it i just like went that. to our poster session where there was an amazing guy for 40 years studying diabetes and his show and it's all about the he called it the contained body the way that everything's engineered to just not move much much and yeah. it's like when you do 
exercise much. We just need to be moving, doing normal things. Yes, thing. yes. So yes, he's onto something. Into some very interesting um, manipulations of our environments to make us move more, mm -hmm. and that's really fun because it also it gets blood flowing, it cognition increasing, it's, you feel looser, it's yeah. not as tight, you live longer. There's so many important points to it. Yeah. So, okay, now what now what else about eating styles because I still I'm so fascinated with the distinction that you made between eating styles and the food we eat mm -hmm. and the, just there being such a big distinction so interesting. Um, what else? Uh, you know, it's funny thing is that it took me a lot of work to make that distinction because mm -hmm. when I first suggested it, saying, "Hey, doesn't it make sense?" This all of this. Um, the way I did it, I had people read a bunch of cards with statements about healthy eating on them, and I knew some of them would be focused on food and some would be focused on the way that you consume it. Uh, when I tried to publish it, I got feedback saying, "Well, we don't think they're different." I was like, "They obviously are." But I had to go through all of the statistics and the models to show like, no, 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 everyone perceives them as two different groups. They're kind of part of the same thing. They're all about yeah. eating. But um, there's something to be said about, and I think Michael Pollan calls it nutritionism, like this real big focus on what's in the foods in terms of the nutrients mm -hmm. and not thinking about other oh, characteristics of food, like, hey, maybe how they're produced, right? Yes. But it's important to go even a little bit further from that and how do you consume them exactly. Yeah, yeah. And That's so it's cool. not just how cool. late or early, it's not just the pattern, meaning like, is it better to have a couple of big meals? Yeah. Or is it okay to snack more yeah. often? Uh, but it's also things like, um, what are you doing while you're eating? Yes. Distraction wise, That's huge. right? Um, it's also the state you're eating in. I didn't really go into that into my research, but are you eating in a positive uh, atmosphere, basically? Are you stressed? Because While that can matter eating. as well. Yeah. Uh, so there's, and there could be more Whoa. of these eating styles that, um, aspects that really matter. I was really, I was looking at what people were telling me in the interviews, so I focused a lot on that. And my Eastern Europeans really cared about not eating late at night. Yeah. And um, though I don't do any kind of clinical work, that's when I started doing all this research. It's like, wait, is there evidence for this? And I was like, yes. All yeah. this research is coming out about eating after a certain hour, eating close to bedtime. Yeah. It affects our metabolism in not the best ways. Yeah, so there's, there could be more. I have to do more research. Yes, yeah. yes, I want, uh, wow. Okay, you, you gave this really interesting sort of um, like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly know how to. It, concentric circles. I don't think um, have it mm -hmm. makes sense. But there's 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 a different way to visualize it. But it's a way to visualize where you have the nutritionist sort of thinking mm -hmm. of what are the nutrients in the food, and then like the next layer would be like or a layer abstracted from the nutrition would be um, how is that food sourced and produced. Yeah, is it not. a whole, is it process, you know, you're going a little bit further, right? Yes. So, and all then, very important. Mm -hmm. And then the next layer is, um, how are you consuming that food? Yeah. Is what style are you consuming it with? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you gave a very interesting example about the, um, uh, um, whether you're happy or sad while you're eating food. There's yeah, another, some work on that. There's mm -hmm. another one of, um, um, I, I personally found that, find that, when I am, <clears throat> when I give like gratitude to the food mm. that I find um, more, I guess, connection to earth and connection to nutrients and, and, yeah. and whatnot. So I'm like blessing the meal and yeah. blessing earth for giving people me this meal. People who pray before they eat, there's something to it probably. There's I should something do to more the research, respecting you know? the food. There's something there. And mm -hmm. then also the, um, when I'm, there's, I, 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 I'm starting to really feel a difference between when I'm eating and I'm just eating slowly and looking at the food versus when I'm watching a video mm -hmm. while I'm eating. There's definitely some evidence for that, the fact that that matters. The pace is another thing I forgot. Yeah. It definitely matters as well. I and eat so slowly. Yeah? I, I, I enjoy eating slowly. That's good. It's That's really good, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, like chewing your food, like whatever grandma used to say, chew your food a hundred times See what you said, before. grandma? I was just about to tell yeah. you. At some point, somebody told me, what, what is all this stuff on the cards? like grandma science. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, that's actually the cutting edge yeah, right now. Yeah, that's cutting edge but science. <laughs> it's coming, it is true that it's been around. And when, yeah. like, when I think about back to growing up in Ukraine, things that your parents would say, there's like all these little sayings like, oh, when you're eating, you're not supposed to be chatting or talking, just like focus, yeah. take your time, don't hurry, you yeah. know? So there's a lot to it. And now there's finally more evidence because people are focusing on that and not just on nutritional composition, which is also important, but we know a lot about it. We know it matters. 
you know, and there's more to the picture. Yeah, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoa, grandma being cutting edge science is grandma so Grandma cutting edge science. That's I like so that. That's <laughs> so, so interesting. It's kind of like the Lindy effect where the knowledge that's been preserved over time will likely be around that much longer, mm. but all this new stuff that comes out every single day yeah. could be obsolete tomorrow because it's new stuff. It's brand mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's so interesting. Yeah, and there's something uh, quite, I don't know how to call it, Western about nutritionism because that's where the science is coming from. So the only other literature I found that was looking into eating styles uh, or whatever they choose to yeah. call it was like Japan, Turkey. Yeah. And so I couldn't yeah. quite find anything else. And that's going back to this older beliefs of what, what it means to eat well. Japan so like has harahachi bu. You eat till you're three quarters full, eighty percent full. Yeah. Yeah. That's another. That's definitely some you know eating style consideration. And what was Turkey's? Uh, the, it's, it wasn't anything particularly called, it was just uh, showing that they were interviewing a bunch of workers in the factory or whatnot, and they were showing like, hey, all these people really cared about the time and the fact that yeah. there are certain meals, yes, yes. so they cared about a lot and not as much about nutrition as some of the other societies. And I was like, oh, there it is again. Interesting. So it's so, I think it's coming back through science now through evidence and people are going to start paying attention. Wow, so there might be a lot more weight on how we eat than what we eat. If we're eating the okay, like okay sized portions, not excessive mm -hmm. portions, and if we're eating maybe two medium-ish meals a day and then we're intermittently fasting, it might not even matter potentially so much if we are eating like all of the people are now uh, <laughs> gluten-free like, right, and right, right. Uh, vegan mm -hmm. and paleo and carnivorous yeah. only and stuff. So. So, because I've also heard people just say that, oh, if you're paleo, you can just eat all you want all day long, like no problem. Or if you're fruitarian, you can just eat only ah. fruits, as many fruits as you want all day long. I uh, uh, I love these topics. <laughs> I love why people go into alternative health <laughs> yeah. the past because I did before. I've tried stuff like that too. Oh, I tried it all. Uh, yeah, and I yeah. kind of like it all. Yeah. Paleo is my favorite, yeah. but for no particular yeah. reason. Uh, I just did a guest lecture at Loyola uh -huh. uh, Marymount University uh -huh. in LA, not Chicago, uh -huh. and in evolutionary psychology class. And I think they were all really impressed because like you say, hey, you can eat anything as long as it's paleo. I had this amazing slide, I wish I had it here, of um, trying to get people to you guess. You can send it to me and I'll, I'll embed could, it. Yeah. I'm really proud of it. And it's like all these fruits and vegetables, right, that are paleo, that you, are great to eat. And then I show what they would look like 10,000 years ago. And it just looks all like grass and fiber and disgusting stuff that you would never want to eat. People at ASU, there was one researcher studying hunter-gatherers somewhere in the Amazon, and one of the things I remember from his talk, he said, they hate vegetables. They're disgusting, they're bitter, they're fibrous. They want fruit all the time. So it's not just us that don't like vegetables, it's all the hunter-gatherers. Because those vegetables look like weeds, you know? They've oh. been domesticated, so technically you can't eat paleo now, even if you really wanted to. There's just no way. An apple didn't look the same way, a banana, definitely yeah, not. Yeah, corn used to be like this. That for sure. See, yeah. everybody knows corn, but everything else you can imagine right now, it's just, that's not how it looked. So, I love evolutionary stuff. Yeah. I do a lot of that. Too, and so, so. so there, a lot of the hunter-gatherer was, uh, was fruit or meat, it was less so the vegetable. Well, first of all, it was whatever was available. Whatever so if was that available, wasn't available, yeah. they'd be doing a lot of root vegetables and root figuring out how to yeah. consume it. Cooking was important because you could make yes. something that's just not edible at all into something more or less mm. okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I went to another, it was last year here at AAA, and it was the best talk ever that made me realize that all of this protein in, let's call them paleolithic diets, there was a lot of yeah. variation, but a lot of it could have been completely insects. So we're not talking about. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And there yeah. is coming, did you see uh, cricket bars? Yeah, we have, there's a whole resurgence. We had yeah. chirp chips on our show. We, there's cool. a whole resurgence of eating. I love that. The West, Western people are looking at the East going like, they eat crickets and then we're like, how can we package crickets to make people eat crickets? I tried those bars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they taste well, normal. Tell, so. Taste normal to yeah, me, yeah. It's the way to go probably. Interesting. 
Um, so okay, what about what about now with what's going on with you with research? I really am interested in this. Um, at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Okay, what the hell are you researching <laughs> about Los Angeles? It was it's very new to me because even though the center is not in any particular field, they're closest to political science. So a lot of the stuff we do is public opinion work. Right now we had a big election study. It's really cool because I'm trying to find ways to ask very interesting questions from a lot of people from a like representative sample. So when we do our big survey every January, we actually can tell how Angelinas think, like everybody in LA County, because we do amazing methodology at getting people that mm. will represent the whole place, you know, the whole area. I want to insert some health things as yes. well with time, but I've been there for less than a year. And um, so the kind of work that we do looks at more about how people feel about current issues. Um, so a lot of the things that we do ends up in the media or decision makers get a hold of that information saying, look at, look at that, people in Los Angeles are really against this and they really like that and they use that information. So it's really cool and more applied than I'm used to, uh -huh. but I do want to insert a little bit more health in there one way or another. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Th that I think that would be really useful data. Mm -hmm. Now, now give me a give me an idea at how one conducts the research to be uh, not not biased to have mm. the best sample size. You yeah. know, the way we do it at uh, Study LA, that's the short version <laughs> instead of the saying the whole study thing. LA. Study LA. Study cool. LA, yeah. We actually, uh, so to get 2400 people to answer a survey that's 20 minutes long mm. stuff, we outsource so somebody else does all the calling. It's mostly on the phone, some of it is online, but you have to really combine it because people who answer the phone are different. They then tend people to be older, answer online. more conservative, this and that. Huh. So you want to have a better representation, so you have to get some online people as well. And once you get all that data, and it's really complicated because we do quotas, so we want all sorts of ethnicities, and we want to make sure we get everyone, so if we didn't get enough Filipinos, we'll keep calling until we get enough of them. So it gets complicated, it takes some time, once we get the data, you can always wait. You can see what your data looks like and you say, but I want this to represent the entire like, county, let's say. So you go to your census, you see what the demographics are, and then you weigh your data to match that better, and so then right. you report results. Okay, okay, so, um, then you, so then let me see. So then you take with the census, it says that uh, X amount of people, let's say 10% of people are Filipino, let's say. Something like that, yeah. Um, and then you, uh, the, the data that you've collected only um, 3% of the data is Filipino. Yeah, you're getting it. Okay, yeah, and yeah. then so then you need to go and pull more Filipinos to bring that the Not data. Not necessarily, you can no, okay. adjust it statistically. So you oh, will you take a look at your data. you can bring sample size down to make them 10%. You can manipulate in certain very careful ways. And uh, it's not just that, it's age, it's uh, ethnicity, it's uh, it's several factors where they live. If we got way too many people from the valley, we, there's not that many people that live there, so we need to kind of statistically diminish them a little bit so we get the correct uh, final picture. And that's why it's amazing. I've never done representative samples, so for me it was very new this mm -hmm. year and it's really impressive because then you can say that, all right, here's how people felt about sexual harassment and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how uh, people in LA County feel. Mm -hmm. Representative. So. Yeah, analysis, when you're doing analysis. public opinion, you actually want to be able to say like, that's how people feel now, just like, here's how our 2,000 how people I felt. feel about <laughs> how other people feel. And then yeah. we can say, break it down, be like, this is how people from this ethnic group feel, or that one, or this age category. That gets really interesting. We just had an election study. We had 120, I had 125 undergraduate students trained in 600 polling place location in LA County collecting data all day. It was crazy. What were they collecting? Uh, one was an exit poll where yeah. you do ask a couple of questions like how did you vote because that you'll actually get the real numbers later you'll be able to see how close your data is and we did really well and LA Times just picked up some of our data and then we asked a bunch of questions about the perceptions of the voting process if they had any issues yeah. we really care about that because we can take it t back to LA County Register Recorder they're changing the election process to voting centers and they want to see how do people feel, do people know what's happening, and do they perceive any benefits of what they're doing. So they're using it for all kinds of ways. It's all cool. It's, it's all kinds of cool stuff that doesn't have anything to do with health, but I think it's so awesome. You know? So it's a new thing for me. But another big thing I do, I still am involved with health. Um, part of the Science Communication Journal Club, yep. the whole point is to help experts, scientists anywhere know how to, how would you talk to the public, how would you talk to a friend or somebody on Facebook about this thing. The more you're in grad school, the, 
the less you remember about how to talk to people, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you sort of lose it, you get really deep into your topic, you get it so well and you know yeah. it so well, and then you, you find it difficult to explain it to someone else. Yeah. So people need to be aware of it, you know, and totally. just make sure they have the right skills. So we just covered the latest research on how do you communicate science. Yes. And my area is food and nutrition. Yes. So I do a lot of like food technology. Things. I wonder what your perspective is on this because we've now had probably a couple years now, this is maybe the third year that we're really passionate about about science communication. Uh -huh. <clears throat> we're starting to think maybe there are certain people that need to just go really, really hard into just the research and then maybe they need a liaison to communicate the science. Yeah. So someone that will hang out with them a lot, learn about it, and then go and speak to the public more professionally about mm -hmm. it. Because they just don't want to. It's not, it, it's not interesting to them. Yeah. And so maybe that's true in some cases, but then there's also this amazing amount of people, which is probably the majority of people, that are interested in speaking to the public about mm -hmm. what their research is, but then they're not able there's not environments like kind of this like it's almost like an open mic night for comedy mm, and they do have stuff there's like that. stuff like that mm -hmm. now um there's like astronomy on tap and there's science cafes science you cafes know? Mm -hmm. um laser talks another one of our yeah. friends piero runs those so yeah there's actually they're starting to form they're, these I know, are starting I'm to form i'm really excited about that but it's not that much yet not right? yeah and yeah. and so i'm i'm I, I wanted to hear your perspective on that because you started talking about it like the more that you focus on the research <laughs> the less you really go and socialize yeah. which is kind of that's how true. i feel it's, it's not data or anything I, I, th I feel similarly about mm -hmm. that and and so we actually have these conversations with scientists and this is a very really? this is a very inter this is a very interesting point because more people feel your the way that mm. we're talking about it yeah. um, and uh, but but also they feel on the when the ma when the majority of them a actually want a place for mm -hmm. them to be able to teach, but they just don't have that place. Yeah. Um, it also builds a very interesting muscle, the muscle of public speaking, mm -hmm. um, which is a completely different. Like you have to synthesize your complex nuance into relatable messages. Yeah. No, this is very, very important, and I understand completely people, you know, there's a lot of pressure to publish and to do your research and to teach. It's overwhelming to be a faculty member, so trying to figure out how to go, yeah, where are you going to go? Uh, let's say you're doing social media, how do you do social media? Yeah. A lot of people are really overwhelmed by that. Yeah. And how do you do it well instead of everyone suddenly turning back on you and, and, you know, it gets political or emotional or whatnot. So a lot of people are just turned off by it. They're like, I, it's a lot of work. I don't get, I mean, it's not part of like what my university cares about right now and I just don't know how to do it well. So with the uh, Science Communication Journal Club, one we do is like, if you're already kind of interested but you're not sure where to start, okay, you can join our chat, listen to the podcast. Let's just see what's going on, what kind of tips we can give you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we don't provide the space for it, obviously. And I'm a, I was talking to a lot of people here, just reminding them, you're younger, you're just still doing it, you have some time, you need to start building those skills now because yeah. it does get harder and you do go deeper into your research and you get really comfortable with academic talk and writing and you have to write a certain way for peer review and you just forget how to say things simpler yeah. and that's not good. Like who, yeah. what, you know. You're building so a muscle over time. And you're, I like you're, that whole yeah, science communication yeah. muscle. But I, yeah, I you gotta do it, you gotta make yeah. a part of it. But there's no incentive sometimes. You know, it just takes time, and let's say university is like, well, we don't that's care. Right, you just publish. Right. You know, do your thing. The, so. I guess the big incentive, I think, to, for us to potentially communicate to other people about the importance of it is that the more that you work that muscle, the better you get at synthesizing the nuance into relatable messages, which will then inspire other people no, in the public to care it's about it. Absolutely important. Everybody recognizes it. It's just lack of time and it's lack difficult. Yeah, but yes, yeah. people who could be hanging out with scientists or whatnot, chatting with them and then explain it to someone else, that's another great opportunity. There are people who do that on Twitter. I see sometimes they summarize somebody else's writing to make it more simple and yeah. accessible. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, it's a whole thing. It's information synthesis. It's so fascinating. Knowledge synthesis is so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sometimes I'll find myself parsing 10 articles on the internet written by different people on a topic like uh, 
um, like Amazon's HQ2, we just did a video on that. And so oh. I, so I would, I would go synthesize ten articles into yeah. something that was uh, relatable for for the public and, and multivariate. So not as new, not just binary, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go and I and I do a video on it on our channel. Yeah. So I think there's a whole growing field of knowledge synthesis that is very mm. fascinating. Yeah, so. people like you then. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool and important. And I feel like it's almost you having to go to them and be like, you know, we can do this stuff. Yeah. And we can help you. And they're like, oh, I think that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be really amazing. And it, you kind of have to be a little like polymathic and empathic. Those are two words that I've been using a lot over the last couple of years. You've uh -huh. got to know a lot about a lot of different things. And you've got to um, have a deep sense to connection to emotional intelligence and knowing how to properly engage people on a oh, yeah. human heart level, but also on a on disseminating the, the ideas in relatable ways. Yes, and I, I have seen examples of people uh, not knowing how to engage the public and turn them off. I have invited people to certain talks where they would feel really unwelcome because of some a scientist said something like, you don't really get this part, you know? So you have to uh, also fix those things. That's so interesting that you bring that up. I mm -hmm. think that that's one that we forget about a lot. It's the idea that we will purposely try and uplift our own ego um, yeah to, to pat ourselves on the back to yeah. the, the yes and versus the no but um, conversation so if someone's asking if they're saying something wrong you know there's there's a difference between being like nah you don't know what you're, mm -hmm. you're talking about versus saying that oh um, it's actually a little bit different or it's somewhat different or whatever you need to say to make that person um, understand yeah. that and then you know give them that love and that kindness and, um, and rather than a s disrespect and rudeness and, yeah, and superiority that's a that's a good there, point. there's a big thing in science communication that uh, what makes sense doesn't necessarily mean it's true it's not about telling facts because that's not changing people's minds. It's about meeting them on a different level, emotional that's level, yeah. uh, in terms of what their worldview is. That seems to work. It's harder yeah. than just saying, "Well, here's ABC, so don't you get it?" You know, it's, that doesn't seem to work. Oh, that's you need cool. to relate to people. That's cool. Yeah. So, so, so you, 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 you. At, I'm fascinated with questions. I just did a talk on the art of powerful questions in San Francisco, Ooh. and. At TEDx over there, and there was this, there was watch this, your videos. there's this, yeah. there's this super interesting way of asking people questions, gaining perspective about their worldview, then meeting them with your inf knowledge that you're trying to communicate mm -hmm. to them to a level where you're now combining their worldview or you're making their worldview aware of oh. what knowledge you're teaching, which is kind of what you're saying, yeah. versus just spewing your own facts at them and hoping that they integrate it. So right. there's this big distinction between those That's two. That's very interesting. I'm going to have to watch that video because that's yeah. a big thing in science communication. No, I'll find it anyway. But uh, it's about listening, right? And we say it a lot in our journal club and people are like, okay, we know, we know, but what does that mean? And how you, to do that well, that's a certain skill. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to watch the video. Sure. Yeah, I'll send it to yeah. you after this. And mm -hmm. this is also, I'm happy we talked about science communication for so long because <laughs> you and you and I just went and played some really interesting tennis about the, about mm. um, unpacking it. That was a good set. It was a really strong segment. I haven't done a strong segment on science communication really? in a while. That was a really strong oh, one. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I'm that was excited. good. I want to yeah. ask you about the what you're going to be teaching in January at Loyola Marymount mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Yeah, actually, it's a very interesting course. It's in the political science department, which I'm not a political scientist, but it's preparing students for, is completely different, preparing them for the job market, the world out there. How do you even talk to people? How do you, not just how do you write your resume and cover mm. letter, but how do you go out there? How do you make yourself likable, a mm. person who people want to work with? Mm -hmm. And just preparing them, basically giving them an internship. They're all doing an internship, reflecting on it, and just really trying to prepare them outside of school. <laughs> One of the things, I mean, I did all these degrees, right? And every time I left, I felt like I was never prepared to leave and find what to do with all this knowledge I just gained in the real world. So that's kind of one of the points of the course. It's like an internship course. I also guest lecture, I'll keep le guest lecturing in the psychology department. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. And it's the evolutionary psychology class. Nice. And I tend to do the food stuff. And I think students really love it, seeing how we have evolved to have certain food preferences, that it's okay that we love sugar and fat and we hate bitter things, thus we don't like vegetables as much. It's like, they love that stuff. 
So, Whoa. so that's that's my fun one to teach. So that's food. It's like psych psychology of food and food science. Pretty okay. much, it's psychology of human food preference. Human preference. But it goes into all sorts of things, like the fact that uh, you it's know, like addictive to eat sugar versus like the. It's yeah. really rewarding. Yeah. There's. I wrote an article about food addiction. There's a lot of science skeptics and uh, proponents, and they don't know how to meet something that it's just the worst idea. It's stupid. Others are totally into it. So I don't have an answer if it's a thing. Food addiction is real. Um, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Food addiction's yeah. real. I would say so, but I, I don't have the data, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. But it's it's also okay. It's like these things yeah. have been very rare and very, they were very rare. rewarding yeah. and you would never die Civilization from Civilization just got to like the ability to be addicted to food yeah. e easily. Yeah. yeah. The funny thing is that we seem to be um, adapting to these things as well. I mean, we've adapted to milk and grains in many societies have developed certain things to make them digestible. It's amazing, like in 7,000 years, that's it. Yeah. So there are some talks about like, this kind of sucks, it's not the best diet, but we're actually gonna be able to adapt to it to not be all sick and super overweight. We'll see, I don't know. That, and okay, so, so there's the psychology food preference, which is so cool. I, I'm, it's the coolest. I, I would yeah. really like to see some recorded sessions, please. Actually it was recorded, Good. I think. Yeah. Okay, good, good, I wanna see these. And then also, um, on the, um, on the, on the, on the, like kind of like how to present yourself into the the poli side side mm -hmm. of things. Um, I, I'm interested. What are some of the principles that you recommend people to be likable? Because for I guess for me, um, one that comes to mind is when you first meet someone, you can kind of tell their vibe, their aura, really quick. And the more like loving and caring and gentle and present you are with that 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 vibe between people, the more you'll get further in life in my opinion and um, and also I think um, I think there's another aspect to it which is even if that person is not on that vibe they will come down from their like let's say mm -hmm. their arrogance or their anger or their frustration or whatever they're feeling whatever it is probably insecurity in one way or another yeah. you know um, so you know this is all like spoiler alerts because I haven't taught the class yet and yeah. we're still I'm co-teaching it with uh, Brianne Gilbert yeah. she's amazing and cool. she's taught the class before so we're gonna be thinking about what we want to add to it but it's even things like that you know I was talking to the student the other day um, telling them about the importance of you know everyone you talk to um, just pay attention to them you know listen to them it's all things like that make sense and he was like <laughs> really you know so just just kind of pay attention to every person you talk to. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> just like they're one and only in right in front of you because that's what you're doing at the moment, you know? And at some point when you're looking for a job, for a lot of faculty positions, you know, when they close doors and they discuss who they like, they're like, would you write a paper with them? Would you wanna like be in the same room with them? Because yeah. yeah. at some point like we're all great and we yeah. have all the skills, yeah. that's all there. But do you wanna work with this person? Because that's really important. important. Yeah, exactly. You know? So it's making sure you're that kind of person that's flexible that can work with anyone, that um, affects others well, and like you say, is even able to bring down other people from whatever they're dealing with yeah. by being relaxed yeah. and listening. It's things that make sense to all of us, but I think they need to be told to people yeah. once in a while. Yeah, so it's like the, you know? more, the more grounded you are in being calm and being kind and loving, the more you can help others ground there, even if they're not feeling it. Also, it was cool how you, <clears throat> how you um how you said that like the simple one of even giving someone the full perception the full attention, attention yeah. while they're speaking to you is so 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 important and it just it it does it does feel like these these have slowly moved us in a strange direction away from being mm. able to give and i and i when i and there's a difference, I think, when I sit down with someone and mm -hmm. I say, you know, oh, is it okay with you if I take notes on what we're talking about? And they're like, oh, they're yeah. taking notes on this. That's very important. Or, or you know, here I have notes about you, talking points that I want to address, so it's there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, so I think there's making a like a very uh, transparent distinction of focus. But these these in so many ways have taken us away from giving a hundred percent attention. Yeah, yeah and people. as I'm going to be teaching that, there's an amazing psychologist at LMU and she looks into first impressions basically. And it's all the stuff that should make sense to us already, but it's, it is things like, don't look down on your phone unless you make a disclaimer and the person knows why. They're just assuming that you're not paying attention. You know, it's That's all these right. things, eye contact, this, that, shake your hand, don't look at your phone. 
there's science behind it too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you yeah. give that, if you give like a solid hug to <laughs> someone, you know, if you give a really loving like hug to someone, mm -hmm. you can you can ease people, you can ground people. You know, if they don't want a hug and you give a handshake, you know, give them, look them in the eyes and give them yeah. like a fairly firm handshake and, mm -hmm. like, and, um, and express how interested you are in, in chatting with them. That's why you're there, yeah. you know. And it's, you know, it's not fake. You're not manipulating anyone. You're actually paying attention. Exactly. So it's kind yeah. of just being aware of it. Whoa. <laughs> I want to blow your mind. <laughs> I like no, I just like the class idea so you much. You want to take the class? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to come down as a as a guest. Like I want to put together like a guest yeah. like a guest lecture. I'd love to come and do like a, a That's really cool. You guys can I'll send I'll send you an idea and yeah. then if you want and if you guys like it, then I can come down and, and I'm do sure it you have a time. lot of interesting topics to discuss. So yeah, that'd I be would, really cool to, to talk about. Thank you. I would yeah. I would be so honored to come mm -hmm. and do that. And there, and I just, this has been so fascinating and multivariate and, you know, it's, it's really interesting how many people here are just hyper multidisciplinary like you mm -hmm. and, and even, um, you know, um, Jason and Elise that we've had um, on the show earlier today also been just so, so multidisciplinary. Yeah. That seems to be a very central trait of anthropologists. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's becoming more and more popular, and in some ways it makes it a bit harder. It makes it harder on the job market because then you don't have a particular field you're really rooted in, mm. but it is the right move. You know, one of the questions today was like, well, you guys will come here and you talk and then nothing happens. It's amazing how much we need to catch up with all the knowledge production that's happening. Yes. We need this event sometimes to just be like, what's everyone else doing? I have no idea, I'm not a robot, you know? Yeah, yeah. I can't get all the information. So that's where we get in. We listen to everything um, and it affects our work and what we do next and we know w what someone else is not doing so we could do it and you know fill the gaps but the point is um, interdisciplinary is so important when I was doing my research right I'm in anthropology but I'm also pulling from nutrition and psychology and I realized that these fields don't always talk to each other yes. when you look at their literature it's like ooh, you're saying this all makes sense but you're actually missing this you should be also considering that from a different field so you have yeah Yep. All these things are complex, yep. they need different lenses. So it's the right move, and it's happening. Yeah. This has been so much fun, and I think, you know, I've learned a lot. Thank yeah, you for sitting so down with us, Maria. This you know? has been a lot Thank of fun. Thank you for inviting me. Thank I'm glad we're in into each other just like that. Yeah, you know? exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think there's reasons. I, I like to live in a world of magic and possibility and joy. <laughs> and, and there is a reason for meeting mm. people in the universe because it's fun to live that way sometimes. It is fun to live that way. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 So thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. This has been a super fun episode. Um, give us your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, check out Maria's links in the bio, please. Go look at her work. Also, um, go and build the future. Go manifest your destiny into the world. This has been an awesome conversation in partnership with American Anthropological Association, AAA. Much love, everyone, and we will see you soon. Peace. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Wow. Rocking. Rockin'. You are right. You are a professional and Aww, it, you did make you. it easier for me.